23 of understanding the kingdom. And I've probably got a couple more lessons that I'm going to do out of the Old Testament before getting into the New because nobody brings the kingdom like Jesus. And uh, we can find that historically. We can find that prophetically. And I'm here to testify that I can find that personally. Nobody brings the kingdom like Jesus. As I was going through and weighing the last week or so and really dealing with um, which story to pick. You know, there's, there's so many that we can do. And, you know, and my thoughts went to Elijah and Mount Carmel and, and different ones. But as I, as I went and began to meditate on Josiah, I see a type and shadow in him of the remnant. And what we're called to do and the task that is before us now, Josiah is an interesting individual because the first time that we hear of him is in 1 Kings chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, and it was uttered 350 years before he was born. We have the calamity that happened after the death of Solomon and the things that he had brought into Judah and the abominations that he had established as he was bitten by the mystery religion bug that he brought and built in the altars of Ashtaroth and Molech and he began to build allow pagan temples to be built in Jerusalem. And so there was a prophetic word that came forth in 1 Kings 13, 1 and 2, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense, and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord, and saith, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, Behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name. And upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burnt incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. Now imagine that because Really what Jeroboam was doing here is he was offering incense to other gods. And so a man of God, a prophet of God, comes up and begins prophesying to the altar and said, there's one coming. Now you were originally constructed to have incense burned unto Yahweh Elohim upon you. And not only will that be established once again, but the bones of the men that brought this into Israel, the, the bones of the men that propagated this, in Judah, that not only are, is the incense unto the Lord going to be burned, but the bones of these very men are going to be burnt upon this altar. You want to talk about zeal for God. Now, in 350 years when we get into 2 Kings 22, we find that Jerusalem has become mystery Babylon. That in the temple of God, there are altars to Baal that, that as you read through these two chapters, that everywhere you go, it's, it's mystery. Babylon has overtaken everything in Jerusalem. The temple of God is in complete disrepair and that they have lost the Word of God. Nobody even knows what the Word of God is anymore. Does that kind of sound familiar like today? Nobody knows what the Word of God is in fact, I had a friend, Errol Berkowitz, wrote a wonderful book based upon Josiah. It's called The Torah Rediscovered. Because we, we find that he had a different heart. Even though he had no way of knowing God. Because also, as it, he, took, he became king of Israel at eight. Can you imagine? King of Israel. But God had put something on the inside of his heart. In 2 Kings 22 and 2 and said, he, that he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father and turned not aside to the right hand nor to the left. Now, he had this big 
job that he had to do because beginning with Solomon, when Solomon brought the mystery religions in, now this is what the mystery religions do. In the Old Testament, whenever you talk about leaven, it is of sin and as of mystery of the mystery religions that once you let them in, they begin propagating until they take over everything. And that's exactly what happened in Israel. We need to understand that the mystery religions always view the long game. Just like they have here in America. I look at progressivism, which is a manifestation of mystery Babylon. And it was introduced in America by a Republican, not a Democrat. And then the Democrats took it over. But... But they started at the beginning of the 20th century. We're now beginning to see the crescendo of now that is actually getting to the place where it's ludicrous. They're literally trying to remold society to, to be both an expression of the bricks that built Babylon and the Tower of Babel, but also of their god, Baphomet that there can be no distinction between male and female anymore. All these different things are going on. All this was be- began over a hundred years ago. They always have the long game. Now, Christians can't plan b- b- between now and what they're going to do this summer because we, we have lost the ability. You see, what we do and how we walk with God in our lives helps the next generation to build upon them. They either get veered off course by our mistakes that we never repent of, or they can build upon and stand on the shoulders of where we are. We've lost grasp of that because we are too busy about it all being about us. I read an article yesterday that as the corporate world are looking at those that are graduating college right now, that what they're seeing because of ADHD and, and all, the, all the different things that are going on and the depression and, and the me attitude that it's, you know, it's like what you've done for me lately type of thing that everybody has. We have, we have a generation that is not work fickle. They want, they want what a guy gets when he works 60 hours a week, but they want to work six. And they look at this generation coming up and they declare that this is the most unstable generation on record. Most unstable. That they will run after anything that promises them everything. And see, that, that's the thing of the mystery religions. They will promise you everything and give you nothing. And then they point their finger and say, oh yeah, well, it's that guy's fault over there. If we could just silence the Christians, we could have a Luciferian utopia. Oh, really? Well, show me where that worked in any nation. Yeah, but even though it didn't work in that nation, it was because some Christians existed on the other side of the planet is the reason that it didn't work. It always brings, it, Nimrod is the beginning, he, he, he was an oppressor. He ruled without mercy, and that's what they're trying to bring. And so they always have this long game. Christians, we need to understand, that's why the Bible says that we are to train up a way, the way that the child is supposed to go, knowing that we are responsible to lift up the next generation, to encourage them to walk with God. Now Josiah didn't have that. 350 years of getting deeper and deeper and deeper into the mystery religions to where everywhere in in Israel or everywhere within Judah, everywhere within Jerusalem that you looked, you could find no trace of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so this young man being put into an impossible situation says, you know what? It's time that we begin repairing the house of God again. Now I guarantee you that the house of Baal, the house of Molech, the house of Ashtaroth, although they, they were not in disrepair. In fact, the bones of great mystics were buried all over Jerusalem. They were honored. They had shrines and all these different things. And he said, you know what? We're going to do something different. We're going to begin to repair And as they began to repair the temple, an amazing discovery was made. They found a Torah scroll. You see, we're we're beginning to realize in this age that the temple of the Lord, the body of Christ, is in disrepair. We We have been 
uh, absolutely saturated with the mystery religions to the place that there's, there is no real trace of the faith of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, or may I even say the Apostle Paul. It is a hard thing to find anymore without having the leaven and, and the, the infection of mystery Babylon. We read in verses 10 and 11 of 2 Kings 22, And Shaphan, the scribe, showed the king. and so the, the high priest discovers the book. He shows it. He then gives it to the, the scribe. And the scribe runs and takes it to the king, saying, Achaia, the high priest, hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. So this is the first time in the king's life that he has ever heard the Torah of God. All of a sudden, can you imagine? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And he looks around and goes, uh-oh. <laughs> you will not do the way of the pagan and, and do it unto me. Uh-oh. These things are an abomination. Uh-oh. What does it say the king does? And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. He began to mourn. You see, there's something that happens in the heart of the remnant. When we discover that the Bible began before Matthew, we discover that the Apostle Paul, Jesus plus the Old Testament, he turned the world upside down. And we need to realize that the New Testament and grace without the Old Testament, we can't even turn a Dixie cup upside down. The church is making no impact anymore in America because we have taken the grace of God so far out of bounds. One of the things that I'm constantly trying to teach aspirants of the ministry is if you take the New Testament and separate it from the Old, you have literally taken the entire New Testament out of context. But there are those of us that have the heart like Josiah. That we begin look around, we're looking around saying, you know what, I don't like this junk anymore. There's, there's, something, go, there's something going on. There's something that needs to be rebuilt. And as we start investigating on building something better, something according to God's word, all of a sudden we discover by providence. You see, there's a spiritual awakening going on. That when people understand the purpose of Torah, the purpose of, the, of understanding the ways of God, and get out of this Greco-Roman or Roman Catholic mindset that law is bad. Torah literally means the loving instruction of the Father. Now set this back in context because what Paul was trying to do in all of the New Testament you're not saved by keeping Torah. You keep the Torah because you're saved. But imagine this. You, can you imagine the Apostle Paul in Jewish ears, whenever you hear Torah, you hear the loving instruction of Almighty God. The loving instruction. Now Christ has freed us from the loving instruction of Almighty God. We would look at him and say, you're an idiot. But that's standard theology today. And because of that, because in the Torah is the definition of God says, this is acceptable worship. These are my ways. These are my statutes. These are my judgment. What do you mean by judgment? God says, I judge this is right, and I judge this is wrong. This is of me. This is of mystery Babylon. We got to get rid of those definitions because if we get rid of those definitions, then we can allow anything in that we like. And you get enough of us together, we can start a denomination. This as long as we ignore this word. We can begin to tell people the grace of God allows you to sin and God's just got to accept you in. And once you get in, he can't kick you out. When the word says, he that remains faithful, faithful, faithful to the God of this Bible and his word to the end is saved. 
Can you imagine? Now, Josiah, like the remnant, when he hears the word, and I've heard people that I've taught and enable them to connect the dots, every major doctrine, every real doctrine of the Bible begins in Torah and it expands from there, but it never leaves its basic definition. What God reveals as sin is always forever and ever and ever and ever sin. It doesn't change it, never, ever. The gospel changes us, not sin. That's how powerful it is. It changes us so that we don't want to do that. But when the remnant hear the ways of God, we repent and then we're moved to action. Now we pick up here in 2 Kings 23 verses 1 through 3. And the king sent and gathered unto him all the elders of Judah and of Jerusalem. And the king went up into the house of the Lord. And all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem with him. And the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the house of God. Whew. You want to talk about a long service. The pastor, my feet are hurting. Imagine that service. And the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before God to walk after God and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all their heart and with all their soul and to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people stood to the covenant. That's the remnant. And what you begin to see what happens now from, from the, and it, it takes about eight years to get all the junk out of Jerusalem. He goes through and, and within these two chapters, it lists how that they, they destroy this temple and they bring out all the junk of Baal. They bring all the stuff out of, 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 of Babylon that snuck in and all these men's bones of these revered mystics, he dug up and he burnt at the altar, just like was prophesied 350 years before. Can you imagine hearing the Torah, then, then the writings, and all of a sudden he got to 1 Kings. And he hears his name called as Israel was split into two because of the sin of Solomon. Israel had been split into two and began to do pagan worship even back then. And there was a man rose up and said, one day, everything that you're doing, there's going to come a man that's going to burn the bones of the men that did all this upon the altar of incense. And was apologizing. Heaven was apologizing to the altar of incense. My goodness. How many know there needs to be some burning going on in the body of Christ? He began to cleanse the land, but what I, what I love about what it, it, it shares here, and this is in 2 Kings 23, verses 12 and 14. He, I mean, he has to go through land because the, the land is scattered. All the high hills have, have uh, uh, pagan altars on the high places. All these different things, so he's having to go through the land. And it says, the altars that were on the top of the upper chambers of Isaiah, which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars uh, which uh, um, my mind just went blank, had made in the courts of the Lord God, the king beat down and break them down from thence, Manasseh, I'm sorry, and the cast the dust of them into the brook Hedron. And the high places that were before Jerusalem that were on the right hand of the Mount of Corruption. The Mount of Corruption? The right hand of the, by Jerusalem. What Solomon had done had made it the Mount right next to Mount Zion. There were three hills and whichever one the Ark of the Covenant was on was considered Mount Zion. But now one of them is considered the Mount of Corruption. which Solomon the king of Israel had built for Ashtaroth the abomination, uh, the, the Zidonians. 
And so we see all these different things. He breaking. He had to go all the way back. And in fact, I'm, I'm just going to throw this in. Many uh, experts, and I'm talking about both Jewish experts and Christian experts, believe that it was on the altar of Ashtaroth is where what we call the Star of David was entered into Israel. In fact, I read after some rabbis that as he married all these women to get bits and pieces of the mystery religions, before that the king's ring had a menorah on it, and he took that off and put the one that had the Star of David on it. It was a hexagram. And a hexagram with a circle is a portal that invokes demons. And they will even tell you in the New Age and all that, that by that signet that he was able to command demons. Which is the purpose of it in the occult. And yet, Josiah had, had this passion so much so that, you know, 350 years later, they'd be saying, that's a national monument. He went and tore all of that down, busted it into pieces, and ground it into dust, and then threw it in the river. The zeal of this man. Guys, there are some things in, in our own heritage because our last generations before us weren't paying attention, didn't care, didn't know, allowed things to be all into Ashtaroth and Molech built within our walk with Christ and in our lives. You know what I have trouble anymore finding someone that didn't have a Freemason in their ancestry somewhere. And everyone that you do find that has a Freemason, their lives are screwed up one way or another. They've got to tear these things down. And God is releasing an anointing just like on Josiah. It's time for us to tear those things down and grind them under the dust. To grind them down where they're nothing but dust and carried away in the river of our lives. And so eight years they go by. Eight years of cleansing the area as well as rebuilding the temple. And so when it is done, we find this in 2 Kings 23, verses 21 and through 23. And the king commanded all the people, saying, Keep the Passover unto the Lord your God, as it is written in the book of this covenant. Surely there has not holden such a Passover from the days of the judges that judged Israel, nor in the days of the kings of Israel, nor the kings of Judah. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, there in this Passover was holden unto the Lord in Jerusalem. He, he cleansed the place and created such a grand Passover that the historians look back and say, we can look all the way back to the judges. Now the judges begin to take over after Joshua died. From then, even during the reign of David, and the reign of Solomon, they had never had such a grand Passover. Why? It's a precious thing to people that have lost covenant, that didn't understand their covenant, that when the covenant is reestablished in their life, how grand and how marvelous it is. You see, the older I get, the more wonderful the cross gets. You see, the Passover was a type and shadow of Jesus coming. That at His first coming, He was the Passover Lamb of God. He was that unleavened bread. He was the first fruits from the dead. I mean, He literally lived and walked out the commandments of God, and then He fulfilled, He brought, and what, and I, I, mean, no, I mean fulfilled by the way of not setting aside, but filling with purpose and reality and richness all of the spring feasts. You see them perfected and personified in Jesus of Nazareth. Oh. This is going to click on you in a minute. Because the remnant are cleaning things up. And there is going to come a preaching of the cross. That is going to be like no generation before us. The preaching of the cross that empowers men to walk in the commandments of God by the Holy Spirit, not by a religious spirit. How many have ever run across somebody in Hebrew roots that was motivated by a religious spirit and they start talking Torah and you want to go... Ugh. 
There's no life in it. You just let Baal morph into something else. You're supposed to grind that stuff down and let it be swept away in the river of God and begin to live it like Jesus lived it. I hear from so many people that, that say, you know, when you guys talk about it, this stuff sounds like fun. Yeah! <laughs> it is! Hell, so we're going, they It's like the old church lady off Saturday Night Live has taken over and she's in the Jewish roots. Come on. You know, the Bible tells us in 2 Kings 23 and 25, and like unto him there was no other king before him that, the Lord, that tur returned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to the law of Moses. Neither after him rose any like him. You see, there's a, there's a remnant. Oh, come on now. There's a remnant that are saying, I think Jesus is coming soon, and I'm beginning to look for his coming. The Apostle John says, here, this is our blessed hope, that when we look for him, that man purifies himself, that woman purifies himself. Oh, you mean he goes through the land within and he turns over all the altars and all the junk of mystery Babylon and he grinds it or she grinds it to dust and sweeps it out the door and says, I'm going to drive those things outside of my boundaries of my life and that everything that I have is going to be based upon I'm going to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my strength and all my soul, not according to what my denomination teaches, not according to what man teaches, but that which Almighty God himself has declared this is what I like oh because there's coming up a remnant like no other remnant before us while the world looks at the generation that's coming up and saying they're the most unstable in all of history there is a remnant rising up that are going to be like granite in the face of the enemy that are not going to be able to be moved that are going to be faithful until the end, that even when the Antichrist himself rises up in great power, they're going to have this passion toward God. You're going to love the Lord your God. Now, has anybody connected love and passion together? He loved the Lord his God with all, like no other person before him. Those that know their God, that in Hebrew it's talking about passion. They're so passionate about God that in the midst of the zenith of all the devil can do in the earth, they're going to they're gonna be passionate about God. And literally what it says in the Hebrew, they're going to be able to create miracles. They're going to be able to create wonderful things of God. That they're going to be like Moses. What do you mean by that, Mike? Israel saw the ways of God. The Bible says Moses understood them. There was a pivotal place in Moses' life. He had the Pharaoh to his back, surrounded by several million griping Jews, and the Red Sea. He started to pray, and God said, Hush, don't pray, do. Don't pray, do. You, you now know my ways. Get her done, boy! And so he says, you know what? <laughs> and he lifted up the rod of, of the shepherd over the sea, and the sea parted. He understood the ways of God. Jesus understood the ways of God since he was God come in the flesh and gave us an example. This is how you move in my power. This is how you rebuke the storm. This is how you command the dead to rise. This is how you command these things to happen. And those that have his passion shall do even greater works than he does. Oh. Why is this so crucial? We come to 2 Kings 23, verses 26 and 27. You see, before Josiah reigned, God said, I had about enough. He had already cleared out the northern tribes. Northern Israel gone to Syria. And you know, it's like Judah may, may would have gotten the, uh, the message. 
the northern tribes aren't anymore. Almighty God came in and that nation is gone. Maybe I'll get right. No, they doubled down on the other. And God said, you know what? I'm about ready to do to you what I did to the northern tribes. But along came Josiah. And in Josiah's reign, he had favor. But it only lasted as long as his reign because the next one came up. Now listen to this. Notwithstanding the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations of Manasseh had provoked him withal. And the Lord said, I will remove Judah from out of my sight as I have removed Israel and will cast this city Jerusalem and will cast off the city Jerusalem which I have chosen and the house of which I said, my name shall be there. I say, Mike, what are you going to get out of all that? Spot judgment. There can be a reprieve. First of all, there can be a reprieve. If God's people will turn to him and do what Josiah did, we can actually buy more time. I, I was reading the, um, someone had sent me a link from a pastor in Chile that uh, was, God had said, I want you to quit your job and I want you to go and I want you to pray eight hours a day at church. And he began to pray under his bishop. And uh, God took him out of his body. And they basically kind of had to put his body on ice for eight hours while he was gone. And he saw the second heaven, how it was filled with demons and all these things. And many of them, believe it or not, were actually being shown in the children's cartoons. And they, and they were bragging to him about how they were destroying the children by being in the cartoons and all this stuff. And, 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 all, and these, this, all of a sudden he saw out of the third heaven this legion of angels came down and had to separate and part through these almost packed demons that were in the second heaven so that he could get to Jesus in the third heaven. They came down, kind of split the sea, if you will. And he got, to commune, he got to commune with the Lord for a while. Really neat testimony. And he said, Lord, how close are we? And basically, Lord said, there, there's no clocks left in heaven. It's midnight. It's done. The wrath of God's getting ready to come. You need to know that everything that's going on right now and what God is doing is because you're on borrowed time by his grace. That's Josiah. That in Josiah's reign, God put the pause button and said, you know what, I can see what's coming after you and I'm going to take care of that. But because of what you're doing, even though it's the midnight hour, I can put a pause button. And let me tell you something. How many have read the book of Exodus? Okay. God is judging Pharaoh, bringing down the greatest nation. And, that, and like the Pharaoh, like the Antichrist, stood in Egypt and said, I am the evening and morning star. I am God. And God brought him down to his knees. But yet there was a Goshen. God can take us through as easily as he can take us out. And one of my concerns is that because we have so banked on, we're getting out of here and nothing's ever going to happen to us. How many know that that, 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 that that theology does not even work with modern history? Tell that to the people in the Middle East. Tell that to people in Europe as World War II was going on. Tell that to the people in China when communism took over. All those that said, we're going to get out of here before it gets too bad, all were killed by the sword of communism. The only reason Christianity still stays today is because the, those that said, you know what, we may have to go through something before the Lord comes back. If, if Jesus said, when you see the desolation of abomination come, run to the mountains, we'll go ahead and run to the mountains because communism is coming. They survived and are now a force to be reckoned with within China. Now, I'm not here to argue about the timing of God, but we need to get out of this mentality that we ain't going to have to go through anything because we're just in wonderful America. Wake up. It's getting harder and harder and harder. And the truth is we don't know how hard it's going to be before the Lord comes back. We don't. We don't know how... 
Where, no matter the, and you know, I've, I've even talked to men now that are, that are pre-trib that are saying, you know what, I'm preparing because I don't know how bad it's going to get even before the beginning of the tribulation period. I don't know how bad. I don't know what the timing is. But what our attitude ought to be is come hail or high water, I'm going to be found faithful. I'm preparing to go through. I'm preparing to get built up. I'm going to make sure that there's nothing of the Antichrist kingdom within me. And I'm willing to go through whatever I need to go through for the sake of Christ. And I will be found faithful faithful you can't play with the world guys and be found faithful because once you let the leaven of mystery religions in you see what happened solomon opened the door and look at the dismal place that jerusalem was in by the time we get to josiah god calls us to burn and to destroy and to eradicate that out of our lives so it's time for us to go back to this and say, God, give me eyes to see, give me ears to hear. Show me your ways and turn, on, turn the, your spotlight of your word on my life so that I can examine it and see what I got to get rid of. Because I choose to be the remnant. I have people all the time say, oh, doctor, like, I just want to be the remnant so bad. If you do what the word says, your remnant material. You see, I think the Apostle Paul hinted this when, in, I think it was 2 Timothy, said, in a great house there are many vessels, some to honor, some to dishonor. But if a man will purge himself, he becomes a vessel of honor. If you will do the work that Josiah did, you will become the remnant. Whether it's the remnant of this generation or the remnant at the end of time, the thing is to be the remnant in our hour. And what we're called to do. And heaven is releasing an anointing in this day and this hour to be that remnant. Now, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, I ask that you would give us the heart of Josiah. Father, to rebuild the temple. And Father, the word says that our bodies are now the temple of the Holy Ghost. And Father, within the framework of our spirit, our soul, and our body, Father, let there be no altars erected to anything or anyone but you. That means every stronghold's got to come down. That means every lie must be brought down and brought to the dust. Father, I ask that you would loose an anointing on your people this day. Father, for us to search out and establish truth. And Father, to kick over every sacred cow, to knock over every sacred altar that even past generations have built, that were not built upon your word, but where mystery Babylon has snuck in. Father, the word says that when Jesus comes back, he's coming back for a bride without spot and wrinkle nor any such thing. And there's even men today that are declaring that that does not necessarily have to be so. Yes, it does. And Father, in us and in our hearts, Father, let us be that bride that has prepared and done the work to reestablish your ways in our lives and in our families and Father, let it first be done within our individual being. Then let it be done in our homes. And Father, then where we congregate. If it's done in that order, it's something the enemy cannot stop. And Father, if there is a preacher that will not yield to truth, Father, it's time for them to step down. Father, let men and women that have a hunger for you and a passion for your word and a passion for your ways, let them be anointed for leadership in this hour. We need spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers that will raise up and teach your people your ways without compromise. And Father, we ask that you would raise up an army of uncompromising men and women around the world that know the stench of Babylon when they smell it and are repulsed by it and desire to be holy as you are holy. And Father, we thank you. We praise you for it today in the name of Jesus.